Hey everybody, it's Beverly again, and I am continuing my vlog on blindness, I think it's called, My Well-Kept Secret. Um, the title probably keeps changing every time I do a video, but it, the, the, the general gist of this whole series of, of talks is about how it was for me growing up as a visually impaired person being legally blind all my life in a sighted world. And it, at the time that I grew up, it was, um, it was thought, it was believed, the, the culture was that as long as your, your handicap or your difference was not seen by others, then you could fit into society. So I grew up um, believing and knowing that that's what I had to do is hide the fact from everybody that I cared about, from everybody that I interacted with, and from just acquaintances. I had to, to hide the fact that I couldn't see. And so a lot of stuff just went unsaid. Um, and, and that was true, you know, from, from the first time I was diagnosed until at least the time that I started at the School for the Blind when I was starting eighth grade. And I remember, you know, doing things physically like, like other kids did. Uh, you know, playing on the playground was never an issue except for I couldn't see people out on the playground as a child. I couldn't identify who my friends were and they would just kind of wait for me at a certain place and we would all do jump rope or something like that. That's back in the day where we kind of had to entertain ourselves at, at recess, at, at, at playtime. And, um, and I could see well enough to really do some intricate jump roping. Um, and uh, volleyball, I actually uh, excelled very nicely in volleyball. I could see the ball coming over the net. I could uh, I could jump and hit it with accuracy. I was very strong, um, and the the ball didn't get lost in the you know in the sky or in the sun. And I could see the white volleyball, and uh, basketball was kind of the same. I had a hard time actually keeping up with where the basketball was. I could hear it a lot, but I couldn't really see it. You know, as far as uh, keeping up with it on such a, a, a quick level because I had blind spots in my field of vision and the ball could get easily lost in that as I'm, you know, going down, up and down the court. Um, and I found at that time that I really enjoyed running and track and things like that. So, so it wasn't all gloom and doom, but the part about the classroom, as I look back on the videos that I've just done uh, in the last several days, it conjures up some pretty sad memories for me um, because I couldn't be myself and because there was, I didn't feel that I, I should share it with anyone and to this day until I'm doing this this series i i haven't really shared this because i felt that if someone were interested they would ask and i've had many many people ask me and then i share whatever it is they're they're asking about i'm happy to share that but to just go off and say well i had this to deal with and i had that to deal with and it 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 makes one of two things happen. Either either people are saying, yeah, 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 well, you know, you had to deal with a lot. Well, I had to deal with a lot also. Or that it conjures up pity. And the last thing I would ever want is someone to think that I was pitiful. And pity is something that um, I think I think is gradually leaving our society, especially as far as 
people with disabilities on an everyday basis. Um, but but I, I haven't shared this emotional time in my life, you know, except for through this video. And so it's, for me, it's kind of hard to conjure this up and talk about it. But I think I left off after, after attending, you know, after attending public school and, and being just put in with the masses, because again, I was with the baby boomer bulge and, uh, there were just too many of us kids. We had, we, we rode the bus as children and, uh, I, I could see the big yellow school bus. I could see that. And, uh, but I couldn't tell what number was on the side of the bus, so I never knew. I was terrified that I was going to get on the wrong bus and be taken somewhere. And then as a child, you know, once you're taken somewhere, you're just, you fall off into the abyss. There's no problem solving there. So I, uh, I, you know, I was always so scared that I would get on the wrong bus. And we had, you know, first bus loads, second bus load, third bus loads. Uh, we just had way too many kids for the amount of uh, uh, buses that we had. And when cars picked me up, like there were several days that, that my my mom would pick me up, I can't, I could not all of my life, I could see a car, uh, the big car itself, but the windshield, the the, the glass of the car just completely reflected everything. So I couldn't see people inside of the car. I remember one time, you know, somebody even saying, there's your mom, so I go and get in the car and it's not my mother. You know, I had no idea until I opened the door and heard the lady's voice, it was not my mother. So I was, I was petrified. So those kind of things happened on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis until um, the, until I left the public school system where there were no accommodations. You know, there was no, not only were there no accommodations, I couldn't, I couldn't tell people what accommodations I needed, if any. And I couldn't tell people that, that I had needs. I just couldn't share those. I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to share those. Um, so I, I, I remember, I remember thinking, okay, I'm going away to the school for the blind. I'm leaving my home. I'm leaving everything I know. Um, it's not perfect, but it's what I know. And it's my family that I love dearly. And my dad was real sick at that time. He had a terminal illness. Um, and, uh, so it was really hard for me to to, to be brave and say, okay, I've got to make this major change in my life and I have to now leave my, my neighborhood, my family, everything I've known and go away to a residential school. And um, so the, like everything else in life, it should have been a life experience for me. Like everything else in life, the anticipation and the fear and the, the, the unknowing is the worst part of it because uh, I had anxiety about going away to school. But once I got there, a whole new door had opened for me. Um, I, I still was not a proficient reader. And again, even the school for the blind couldn't address that because their large print books were not large print enough for me. So even if I got the print close to my face and I could read, I could see the letters, but I could never, because of where my blind spot is on the right side, I could never sit and read paragraph after paragraph. After about two lines, my eyes were so fatigued that I couldn't continue. I couldn't read textbooks, even like my classmates at the School for the Blind. Um, and it was an awesome experience in that I met other people that many had juvenile macular degeneration, like what I have. Um, 
many were totally blind, completely blind with no light perception with prosthesis in both eyes. And uh, many used canes for mobility and many could see, you know, well enough to walk around like I could. So it was just, it was just a whole um, myriad of, of different levels of visual impairment. And, uh, but the camaraderie, the ability, the thing that I learned um, at the School for the Blind, if I took nothing else away from it, I was there for three years through eighth grade, ninth grade, and 10th grade. And uh, I developed like best friends people that I could share my heart with because now my secret is no longer a secret unlike everybody else. Um, so so then since that was that element was gone, I could get into my real personality and get into the personalities of other people and really be have a relationship with them at at an equal level that I was never ever allowed to do when I was in public school because I couldn't share my secret. Um, I suppose in so many ways it's like people that are gay um, who, you know, nobody knows you are until you decide or it comes out. And that's kind of my secret that I kept that no one knew that I couldn't see and it was something that eventually became very shameful for me because I felt like if I'm not supposed to talk about it then there's something very wrong with it and and I've, I've worked an adult lifetime getting over that and I've gotten over that that's a uh, that's something that I am I'm happy to say that I've gotten over, but it's so it's so difficult even now to go back through those emotions and and talk about how how shame based the um, the existence was having a severe disability that wasn't visible to everybody and then not being able to talk about it and not being able to share it. Um, but at School for the Blind, I was able to be myself. I was not, uh, I wasn't put into a uh, tract as a completely blind person because at that point, again, my diagnosis was juvenile macular degeneration. And the thought behind that was, I'll never lose all of my sight. I'll always have central vision, I mean, uh, peripheral vision and no central vision. So I, um, even though I didn't have good detailed vision, I had such good mobility vision, ability to move around and to do all kinds of things like gymnastics and swim and, uh, and do track and, you know, uh, do cheerleading and stuff. I did all that and so it looked like uh, I had a lot more vision than I had because I really could, uh, I could see myself in space and I could move around in space and had a very good perception of that. Um, so so the, the powers that be, I'm not sure who that was, but it was decided that I would not be trained, I would not be educated as a completely blind person because at that time it was thought I would not lose my vision. And as long as I could see the large print, even though I wasn't proficient in reading it, um, I, I just was given large print textbooks and said, okay, you're a large print student, you're not a Braille student. Um, and then all of my other friends could just read, 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 read. And, uh, and so I, re <laughs> I remember uh, having an allowance and uh, I, I went to one of the fastest readers that we had and I said, hey, I'll pay you to, to read this material. I've got to get through three chapters tonight. And I can't do it. And uh, she, you know, she said, you don't have to pay me. I'll read. And she could read so fast. And her nose was right on the paper, but she could read so fast. And uh, I had a friend that uh, was a Braille reader, and she could read just as fast as the sighted reader with her nose on the paper. And she would read her Braille, and her fingers would just be flying, flying through the Braille books and reading. And uh, she, she could just, her, 
her fingers were going faster than her mouth could go. So I thought, okay, well, I'm getting an idea of kind of where I fit in. I still, you know, I couldn't read in public school and I can't read in blind school, but I can do all these other things. And I, and I started, I, I let myself go at that point. So the, the beauty of being at the school for the blind in the residential uh, setting is I could be like a normal kid and I became a normal adolescent and um, and that meant things like boys and girls and uh, of course I had had a boyfriend as early as the sixth grade and that was that was really interesting because I don't even think he he knew that I couldn't see uh, he might have known that I don't know because we wouldn't discuss it because it was my secret uh, but he walked me home from school every day and he carried my books and he was so sweet and he lived across town. So he had to walk a long way to get to my house. And and then then once I got to my house, I said, well, I've got to go inside because i got to go watch TV. <laughs> and the poor guy's left. You know, he's got another two miles to walk to his house. But, uh, you know, I had the regular... Um, peer interactions and uh, kid interactions and adolescent or adolescent interactions at the school for the blind that that other kids had the opportunities to have in in public school that I had never been able to to have but I was lucky in that I didn't have to leave home at age five or six or seven and go to the school for the blind. When I got there, so many of my friends had been there since they were tiny little first graders, and they had been out of their home at that age. And I'm, you know, I thought to myself, I'm so blessed to have been with my family in my home that long. So there are pros and cons. There's not there's not an answer for everything. Um, but I, I uh, got through the school for the blind and decided. Uh, at, at, by the by, the time I had finished the tenth grade, my father un, unfortunately had had passed away from his terminal illness, and he was such a such an influence on my life. And you know, according to my mom now, I was an influence on him because dealing with my disability, she said, helped him deal with his terminal illness. He had a brain tumor, and so he had progressive. Lots of systems started shutting down, physical and um, uh, his ability to do things independently, and eventually it took his life. So um, in 11th grade, I came back to public school and uh, finished out high school in public school, and I wasn't as warehoused. It wasn't as much a secret. I had learned at that point to be blind. I had learned how to approach someone and say, I can't see. Um, again, I had a really, really good mobility vision and still ran competitive track in public high school and state competitions. And um, uh, I still did gymnastics and I still swam, um, not competitively at that point, but I still, uh, you know, could do racing and, and did butterflies and and freestyles and uh, those kinds of things. Um, and I couldn't read any of the printed work in in high school. So once again, I sat and listened. There were no accommodations. Now we are up to the mid seventies, and you know there had barely been a uh, federal law, a five hundred four. Um, federal regulation which started touching on the fact that you know if you're if if you have a disability you know and your school gets any federal funding at all then they have to they have to have accommodations but I didn't have any there were no teachers aides there were no uh, there wasn't there was no device that I could use um, I, I wasn't even aware of any devices I didn't have any books on tape no books recorded and everything was issued in print, and I just sat and listened. I even had a French class, 
and uh, it was submersion French. So when I went into the classroom, all English was dropped at the door. And so you walk in and everybody's speaking French and we're all beginners except for the teacher, of course. And so what she's doing at the, at the front of the classroom is holding up pictures and then saying the word in French. <laughs> so I'm going, this is not gonna work. Um, so I just listened. I just listened and listened, and I'm, I, I don't I don't speak French to this day. Um, but I did take two years of French, and uh, and I made decent grades. Uh, we I was given I was given verbal tests. Uh, by the time I was in high school, I could advocate for myself, and I could go tell my teacher I need my tests read out loud to me if we're going to have a test still i was still in the baby boom bubble i call it and uh so we had very overcrowded high school um never enough funding for anything so uh the teachers were just using all the materials that they could get their hands on and i had all kinds of assignments that i would sign up for that were like extra credit that would give the teacher ideas about the kinds of things that i could do uh, but the biggest change in in that part of, of being blind, uh, the biggest change was that I was able to advocate for myself. I was able to go to my teachers and let that secret out and say, it's not a secret anymore. This is who I am and these are this is what I'm going to need in the classroom. Uh, you know, I know you don't have anything else you can offer me, but, you know, if you could please talk out loud um lectures I could excel in because I could take notes and read it at home with my nose on the paper um so uh, you know I would I would do those kinds of things for extra credit and for uh, just as much as I could do to get through high school and I got through with very good grades and uh, then I applied to go to the University of Alabama and um, I, I moved I graduated from high school on one day and the very next day moved into my apartment at the, in Tuscaloosa at the University of Alabama and was no more prepared to do that than the man on the moon. I, it was, that was another issue in and of itself, which had to do with my, my loss of sight. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to cook. I didn't know, uh, I didn't know regular things like for example, my neighbor, after I moved in, my neighbor had to tell me, well, to get your lights turned on in your apartment, you have to go to the power company and establish an account and pay them money and get your lights turned on. So, you know, that doesn't have a lot to do with blindness, except for when I talked to my sister about that. And I said, did you know this stuff? You know, how did, you know, where did I miss out on this? I'm not dumb by any means, but why didn't I understand this? Why, why didn't I know this? And she said, well, you know, thinking about it, I, w I knew how the utilities were paid at home. We didn't talk about that, but she would see envelopes laying around, you know, with the address on it to the power company with a stamp on it. And she would see a checkbook and it would be sitting there and she would see the amounts written out. And, and so all these things that I wasn't aware that were going on just in my own household, um, blindisms, I call them, um, you know, carried through to the time I moved into my apartment. And, you know, I simplified the whole idea by saying I can do this and, and I was allowed to do it. Um, and I, I was rooming with my cousin at the time, but she didn't start school until September, and I was starting school in June because I wanted to get a jump start and kind of find my way around the, the, the campus. And uh, once again, I, I had very good mobility, but I couldn't see, you know, I couldn't see 50 yards away. So I knew that if I followed this sidewalk, that that would take me to this corner. And then I knew if I turned left at that corner, then at the next block, I couldn't see the next block, but I knew that if I got to the next block, I could see the sidewalk fine. I knew if I got to the next corner and went across the street and went down two more blocks 
and made a left, I would be at the building I was supposed to be at. So I couldn't see distances, but I could see in increments and walk to all of my classrooms and get to and from school. But that was also the first time I had ever, ever had accommodations that provided me with books on tape. So we had, we had tape back then. We didn't have CDs or, you know, discs or thumb drives or anything like that because um, this was pre-computer. But I had books on tape and I was in heaven because I could get through all the material that was assigned to me. I could go to my instructor and uh, my professor and say, I need to take this test orally and I need to... Um, uh, have someone uh, write the test, you know, the answers down as I dictate them to them. Uh, some of the tests I could I could write myself, you know, if it was A, B, C, or D, and I could write an A, and I could write a B, and a C, and D. Uh, so multiple choice kinds of tests, you know, if someone read it to me, I could write my own answers. But um, one of the um, <laughs> one of the worst things that had ever happened that I was, I was so determined that I was going to succeed in college. And my freshman, uh, one of the very first classes I took was a speech 101 class. And, um, and so I, you know, I had my speech prepared. I did, I thought I did very well. I couldn't see my index cards. And of course, I, you're not allowed. It's not appropriate to hold an index card up to your face while you're giving a speech. Uh, had I known Braille, I could have absolutely read the Braille with my fingers and kept wonderful eye contact with the audience. But I didn't know Braille. So I thought, well, it's a catch-22 once again. So I have to go back to my first grade experience where I had to memorize stuff. And so I memorized my speech and I did very well on my assigned speeches, but it got time for the test, the actual written test. And in those days, uh, they would give you the test and they would give you a little booklet, a blue booklet to write your answers in. And it was very fine lines on the booklet. And, you know, I'm, of course, I'm demonstrating this with my right hand and I'm left-handed. But I could write on the book. Um, I, could, I could see well enough to write and my penmanship wasn't outstanding because I really couldn't see that well. But I could get the words down. And uh, so my speech class... I remember going in and having my test proctor read the test to me and then I wrote my essay answers and I got my test results back and I got an A- minus for content and an overall D- minus for my test grade. And I was livid. I, I didn't, first of all, I didn't understand the test scoring, but secondly, I didn't understand why are these two things so different and what are they? I didn't know you get two grades on one test. So I went to my instructor. Um, I made an appointment and went in to see her in her office. And I advocated for myself. And I said, this is absolutely, I don't understand this. This is not fair. Why have I got a D minus on this test when you admitted I got an A, an A minus? On, on the content and she said very matter-of-factly that um, my spelling was atrocious, my penmanship was unacceptable, and I retorted that I cannot see. I am legally blind and my penmanship is the best it's ever going to get. This is it. This is the best it's going to be. And my spelling is phonetic because I've always been presented with text orally. I've never had the benefit of seeing the words. And then she retorted, people like you shouldn't be in college. And I was flabbergasted. Um, I was I was pretty angry at this point um, and that I have always had what I considered a very very passive personality keeping my little secret all my my childhood uh, so that made me very passive as a person you know as a personality and then and then I started getting my wings when I went to the school for the blind and I could compare myself and actually get to know myself as a visually impaired person and understand 
my strengths and weaknesses not based on what I could or couldn't see, but based on other characteristics that had nothing to do with sight loss. So, you know, and then I had navigated through public school with no accommodations, and now here I was in college and I was able to access um, materials and I was able to, the, the school actually paid for someone to go with me to the library to read to me. And I was, I was in heaven. I was absolutely in academic heaven. And this lady said, people like you should not be in college. And I said, well, with all due respect, professor, I will um, disagree with you and I will appeal this to the department head of the department of the School of Communications because this was a speech class. And um, she said at that point, um, you are talking to the department head. I am the department head. And I said, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just said thank you for your time. And uh, I exited as quickly as I could, and I went to problem-solving mode, and I said, okay, I've got to get through this speech class because I can't go to any of my, my higher-level classes. You, speech 101 was required, so I said, i got to get through it, and I'm not about to drop out. I'm beyond the dropout date, um, and I've got to salvage a grade out of this somehow, and it's got to be a good grade. So the next two tests that I had, which were the only two tests left in the semester, uh, I brought my test proctor, um, which is the person that you know, reads the test for you in the quiet environment that I needed. And uh, instead of me writing the essays, I said, you will write it. And my proctor had excellent penmanship and excellent uh, spelling. So as I dictated, I, mean, I had very good uh, grammar. I knew my grammar and punctuation and all that stuff. So I, I knew I didn't, I just, I just rattled off words that I had never been able to use before because I, wouldn't, I wasn't able to spell them. So I, uh, I ended up with A's and A's on my other two tests, which then brought my average up to a B. So I got out of that class and, and it taught me something, you know, that that when you think, you know, when you think it, it might fail, it, it doesn't, it doesn't all have to be bad. You can, you can go to plan B, even though you really don't know what plan B is, and you can succeed in plan B. So that was, you know, that was part of my comeuppance, I guess, in, in college, um, I, uh, the, the only accommodations I had were people reading to me out loud and they got paid to do it. My sister at that point was starting college because she started, she started early and, uh, and she would come in the summers and she would read and read and read and read and read, um, uh, just because that's what, you know, that's what she did. She would read to me and, um, uh, because I would exhaust the funding that they would give me. They would give me like 15, 20 hours a week of a reader, and boy, how did they exhaust that really quickly. So I, I learned how to utilize my resources that way and uh, get through college, and I finished college in three years. And, uh, and I was proud of that because I, 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 I came out with a, um, with a pretty high grade point average. We were on a three-point scale, and I, you know, so I, I was at a like a 2.75 on a three-point scale and finished in three years. So I was pretty, you know, puffed up about that. Um, my degree was in therapeutic recreation and I had did some, done some innovative things in college. And, and so college for me was a, a, a way to, to further my independence. Um, I still, you know, everybody else around me could drive and, uh, but, I, but, I, but I enjoyed being on a college campus because I could walk from my apartment to all my classes. And I didn't use a cane at that point, and I didn't need a cane at that point. And, uh, and so it, college was not as daunting as it, it certainly would be now with, with all of my sight loss that I have now. So um, 
that got me through, you know, my undergraduate, and I worked for a while as a as a director of a, a therapeutic recreation center at, at a mental uh, hospital, and uh, and I worked at that as a blind person, you know, as a visually impaired person, legally blind, and um, and I was. 21 years old, you know, when I got that first professional job. So I had kind of been on the accelerated path, I think. And uh, then I got into graduate school and, um, and thoroughly enjoyed the, uh, the specialty that I was in, which was counseling. And uh, of course, being, being visually impaired, all of a sudden, even in, in college, that visual impairment became an asset because it, I had a, a peer of a group of people that were on the track with me in my graduate uh, two two year graduate program, but they would they would actually turn to me as someone who had experienced some of the things that they were learning how to deal with as counselors. So I could see both sides of it. I could I, think I could see the person on one side of the desk and the person on the other side of the desk. And so for the you know that was that was really really um, uh, very invigorating for me as a student as a graduate student. And um, and then I, I graduated and uh, and got my first professional counseling job within about six months. So. You know, I had progressed from this this meek and mild and secretive childhood um, to being myself, to learning who I was at the School for the Blind, and then testing the waters in a public high school and advocating somewhat for myself to tenaciously advocating for for people with disabilities at a university level. And, and that was, you know, I was very involved with, uh, with uh, we called it People United for Self-Help. I was very involved with that and, uh, and worked with people in wheelchairs and people with uh, crutches and people with canes and, and blind people and deaf people all at the university um, while I was there. So I was active in that. So I became an activist, <laughs> you could say. So I ran the gambit and... Uh, and now I think all of those experiences helped me develop who I am as a blind person today. And, and the reason I have done these vlogs is to get through understanding that not everybody gets to go to a school for the blind. You know, not everybody starts out from day one learning their... Um, their language, their written language, the way they should, um, and and not everybody gets the accommodations, and not everybody uh, these things that are entitlements now in the school systems were not always there, and I was a product of a time period when they weren't there, and and I can tell you it was so 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 difficult. And it was, you know, I think I did the best with what I had, but there could have been so much more done, um, you know, if there had been accommodations like there are today. And, and you know, looking at the, the, the teachers that, that started out with me and, and made things happen for me early in school, in elementary school, versus just kind of being warehoused um, toward the end of public school um, until I was able to advocate for myself. It, it just shows you that, that, um, that each individual person with a blindness or a disability has their own backstory. And mine is, uh, it, it's probably not, not totally unique, but it's somewhat unique because I'm, you know, I'm of the age that I've experienced both, you know, both um, not having accommodations to having as many accommodations as were available to me. So uh, I hope this has been informative. It gives you a little insight into what it might be like growing up visually impaired and, um, and at this point in time, you know, I, I still had 
2200, 2400 vision. And so I still visually impaired and not, not as, as severely sight impaired as I am now. But um, I will do more uh, videos. They won't be on this particular subject unless I get comments or requests or questions. Uh, a lot of times I get questions, you know, with just people that I encounter every day. And when I get those questions, I think I should put it on the, uh, I always answer them and address them and, you know, try to get the information to whoever's asking me. But I think, well, if that person is asking, then there could be uh, 10 other people that are asking that out there somewhere. And I'm, I'm happy to answer those questions. And if there are any comments people want to make or suggestions, um, topics, I can cover just about any kind of topic. Um, as it pertains to blindness and disabilities, either perceived or not perceived. So <laughs> thanks for hanging in through my, my uh, catharsis of vlogging about my, about my experiences. And until I do my next video, I hope you have an absolutely wonderful morning or afternoon or evening or day or week or whatever it is that you're having when you watch this video. Bye-bye everybody.